Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, we also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you, if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you, if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Rail Bricker. Rail is the CEO of railbricker.com and is based here in Australia with me, but over on the other side of the continent in Perth. Um, from being 6,000 feet underground in a gold mine to starting an education business that grew to have 4,000 plus students, to spending years working in venture capital, Railbricker has seen it all. He's listed companies on multiple international stock exchanges 
and his financial services group has settled more than $3 billion in loans over 20 years. Rail has the unique distinction of having sold more than $1 billion in mortgages from stage. Rail's diverse uh, work history combined with unique global research interviews with companies in more than 25 countries allows him to work with leaders and managers on growing and achieving excellence as he has experienced the roller coaster himself and knows how to navigate the twists, turns, and loops. If you need Rail to have academic qualifications, he holds two master's degrees, an MBA and an MSc uh, software engineering. He is currently a fellow of the MFAA, Mortgage and Finance Association of Australia, a certified speaking professional, CSP, Professional Speakers Australia, chapter president of PSAWA, and a member of AICD, which is the Australian Institute of Company Directors. And in 2018, Rail published Dive In, Lessons Learnt, since business school and just based on what we had a quick chat about before we press record i think this is going to be a really interesting conversation so rail welcome thank you jonna and it's great to be here even uh, on, on opposite sides of the continent where most people in the world don't understand that it's one of the longest domestic flights in the world between us yeah that's right what is it Ah, oh, I'm terrible six with hours. geography. Six, six hours. hours, yeah, it's a six-hour flight in the one country. That must be that that must blow people's minds in in Europe. I know, particularly where you can travel, uh, you know, across you know multiple countries in that time, let alone domestic flight, like you said. Uh, wonderful to get the chance to chat with you, Rail. I guess initially, can you just give listeners a bit of a window into what you're doing now? What does a day in the life of Rail look like in uh, in 2022? Well, yeah, that, that, that a day in the life is never the same day every day, and in in fact, probably driven by my late father, who who once said to me that when he retires, he wants forty years' experience, not one year forty times over. And I've taken that to a daily level. You know, every day is different. I I spend probably forty percent of my time still in the financial services group, um, leading it. Um, I have a, a team of twelve. And we have a lot of fun. We've, you know, uh, I had a call the other day, which tells you about longevity, where a grandfather called me about his grandson, except the grandfather and his daughter and now the grandson are now all my clients over the last 20 years. So that's that's a really cool thing to be acknowledged by three generations in a family. And the other side of what I do is I I do keynote speaking and a lot of workshops and facilitation in the areas of leadership, culture, and strategy. So that takes up the other sort of 50% of my time, and then I try and exercise for the other 10% of my time. Yeah, that's amazing. I love what your um, what your dad said around wanting to retire with 40 years of experience. Not uh, How did you put it? 40, 40 Not times one year, one? 40 times over. One yeah. year, 40 times over. Yeah, that's really profound. I've never heard that before, but I, I love that, Rail. Um, and on that note, tell us tell us a bit of your story. Tell us, feel free to go back as far as you want and share some of those moments that really shaped you becoming uh, the leader you are today. So, yeah, I'll start off with the mines. I mean, I worked on the age of 14 because I had to. I had to earn money. My parents were sort of lower middle class. I mean, I grew up in the lower middle class suburbs. Um Anyway, my first sort of real job was when I worked on the mines um, after graduation from university, and I had a scholarship because I couldn't afford to go to university, and the, and the scholarship had conditions that I had to go and work on one of their mines. So ended up working on one of their mines, and after about three months there, the black staff, and, and that's not a racist comment, that was just in South Africa, this was pre the, the, the dropping of apartheid, um, the majority of the workforce on the mine were were black. And the staff started calling me Makosi, which in in the vernacular translated into little boss or little man. And, I, and I'm five foot six, so I thought, okay, it, it's just referring to me being short because a lot of the, the workforce were quite tall. But then it was explained to me that Makosi was actually a term of endearment um, only given to people whose leadership they respected. And I never understood that at the time. That wow. I I had this, I don't know what, this presence, this 
this way of talking to people, the way of, of motivating people that was recognized by a largely illiterate workforce as a leadership skill. So I, I, I've struggled for the last 30 years to enunciate what that actually was. But but for me, it was an eye opener. You know, I'd been leader of a lot of community organizations, um, charitable organizations, not for profits, even at that that early stage in my life, you know, the Rotary and Rotaract and and, and, and a number of others. And but I'd never really seen myself as a leader until that point. And so that was an eye opener. I, I then started my own businesses a few years later and obviously had to lead the teams, had 160 staff in the education business, um, reverse listed that on the stock exchange in, in 96, went into venture capital for a number of years, came to Australia, joined a venture fund here, raised money for them and listed them on the stock exchange. And, and that 30 seconds is five or six years of my life. Um, and then I decided I needed to be an entrepreneur again. And so ended up by coincidence. And I guess that's one of my principles of leadership is a lot of leaders try and predefine their journey. They try and predefine the business they're going into. You know, when they come to me as a consultant, as a coach and a mentor and say, my 27th spreadsheet said I should do it. And I say, well, that's 26 spreadsheets too many because you've overthought it. And a lot of people overthink even things like leadership. And so I started this business on a coincidence, uh, the way it started. It's I still own it. It has 12 staff at the moment and has done over 3 billion in mortgages. So that's, that still runs in the background. My offices are in their financial services offices. The real change in my life happened when I was 49. I was training for a marathon and they discovered I had two cardiac stents. And I was told, well, you would have died if you'd carried on training, which is a fairly sobering thought. Wow. And I ended up with two stents and it really focused me on being passionate about what I do. So my mortgage business was built on me speaking on stage and I decided, yeah, let's follow that passion. Let's go and speak, but not about mortgages, not about finance, not about retirement, although I still do a lot of that. But let's go and talk about how to build businesses, how to build leaders, how to strategically plan for your businesses. And so that's what I do today is work with companies and leaders on their excellence, on their, and excellence is a combination of strategy, leadership, and culture. Yeah, wonderful. I can't wait to unpack that a little bit more. I guess if we if we look back at at your journey of growing in your leadership. And like you said, those, I always love those sentences where you, where you go, well, that was probably five or six years that I just summed up in a sentence, you know, <laughs> or in a couple of sentences. Do you remember any moments throughout your journey that really stand out uh, where you, you know, I, there's always moments for each of us where we drop the ball and, and we, and we have a massive learning that really shapes us or where we think we can't do something and, we're able to get it over the line or we, or we work with a leader who just is either so painfully um, frustrating and, and toxic that we go, I never, ever want to be like that. Or the reverse sometimes where we go, I just, if I can be one-tenth of that leader who led me through that. Any any moments that come to mind, Ralph? Well, okay. So when I, when I worked at, at Anglo-American, which was at the time the largest mining house in South Africa, um, after 18 months of working out on the mines about 250 kilometers from Johannesburg, I managed to secure myself a transfer to head office. And I, I must admit, uh, even in my book, I talk about the fact that for many years I confused confidence over confidence and arrogance. And then mm. hopefully in my 50s, I've learned the difference between them. But I got to head office, which was incredibly hierarchically driven. And that was probably the reason I am so anti-hierarchical structures. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean. I was a, a C level four, C4 engineer, which meant I parked in the third parking lot away from the office. If I was a D1 level engineer, one level higher, I would have parked in the second parking lot away from the office. That's how, how, critically defined and how organizationally defined that organization was. And I knew from that day that that wasn't me. But anyway, I got this job at head office. I got 
in my office in the first day and I got escorted in by the boss and handed this corner office. And I did not realize at the time that this young upstart of 22 years old sitting in the corner office had really peed off a whole lot of people whose ambition in the corporate world was to get the corner office. Okay. <laughs> and so, uh, but it, it, it didn't strike me until much later, but I, I carried on with my job. I did what I had to do. Um, and then eight months later, I actually got offered an opportunity to go and do my MBA. And so I left Anglo-American and went off to do my MBA. And about 10 years later, I found my farewell card from the department that I worked with. And the farewell card was very telling. And, you, you know, we're talking on this podcast about the leadership journey. Um, Anglo-American, I said, was the largest listed company on the stock exchange at the time. And the staff had written me a note on this farewell card that said, please remember us when you come back and buy Anglo-American because we'll still be here. And, wow. and to me, that smacked of, of almost this resignation to being stuck in the machine, to having no ambition, you know, all those things. But it also, that was what struck me at the time when I was given the card. But on reflection, it actually reflected that somebody there had seen something in me, something, again, the same as the, the staff on the mines had seen some form of leadership spark that, that I couldn't really articulate because I didn't have the emotional intelligence at the time, but it was there. And so, so for me, that was a, 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 a turning point in my life, although it took me another 10 years to acknowledge it. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's, um, yeah, that's, that's a difficult yeah, that's, send off. Oh, uh, right. Hang on one second. Sorry. Yeah, so that must have been so difficult uh, watching that and, and I guess seeing seeing that resignation. And how did that fuel some of the work you do now around leadership and um, and around excellence? Oh, I'm, I'm an absolute believer in a flat corporate structure. Um, I think... You know, the real concept of open door. I mean, I spend a lot of time and I'm releasing by early March a new tool that I've developed, which actually puts a number on leadership, culture and strategy um, and actually measures it against an ideal of 100. So it puts a percentage on and that's really driven by my utter, I was going to say distaste, but that's probably too hard a word. Um, my My utter belief that I don't think those heavily defined hierarchical corporate structures make any sense anymore. Mm. Um, you know, there's a classic story of, of 1960s when Kennedy visited NASA, and this is seven years before the launch of Apollo 11 and landing on the moon. And um, Kennedy saw this um, cleaner sweeping furiously and, you know, he may have been because the president was there, but he turned around to the cleaner and spoke to him and he said, why are you sweeping so furiously? And the cleaner said, because I'm helping to get a man on the moon. Now, yeah. that is the epitome of the co or corporation that you want to create. I mean, at that same time in my life, I was frustrated because I wanted to know how does my role as an engineer, as a junior engineer, fit in to the production of gold and the profitability of the organization. Yeah. And I was the only person of all my peers who was interested in that. Everyone else was happy to get up in the morning, go to work, you know, not kill anybody, which was probably a big problem on the mines, um, and come home at night. And I wanted to know how do I fit into the greater picture? And I think that hunger of fitting into the greater picture has become more real. You know, millennials today, um, you know, Gen Zs, Millennials, to some extent, the boomers really want to know what contribution are they making? And that, I think, is the sign of a good leader. A good leader conveys to the team how their contribution is making a difference to the organization. Yeah, I, I think that's yeah. a wonderful 
Ooh. sort of definition of sort of definition. what a leader does. How do you, How do you uh, where, where would you start if there was a leader listening who knew they needed to really develop in this area? What, what would be sort of the starting point for them? Well, I think the starting point is actually understanding where the team sit. And so I looked around at all the tools that were available on the market and employee engagement surveys and all that kind of stuff. And, and, I, and I've taken the best of them and actually developed this new tool that measures, you know, the extent of leadership. As, so an ideal leader would measure 100 on the scale. This gives you a number. It's a weighted average scale, a whole lot of different questions put in different ways, etc. So that's one way. But interestingly, there was a Japanese concept years ago called management by walking around. And I actually have done with a number of companies, got the, the C-suite or the management to actually walk around, to actually talk to the team members that they wouldn't normally talk to, not in a formal way, walking up to them in a suit. But, you know, a classic was a client of mine. 240 staff, they were in, in distribution of, of high-end watches or medium-end watches. So to put that into context, it's, it's, it's low volume but high value um, distribution. And I said to the board members, when did you last ask the staff in your warehouse? And it's not a massive organization, 240 people. Mm. How did you, have you asked the staff in the warehouse if there's a more productive way you can do things? And they went, Oh, no, we rely on our supervisors to tell us that. And I said, well, have your supervisors given you any feedback? And they said, no, we've never asked them. So I said to them, do me a favor. Go and put on a fluoro. In Australia, we can call them fluoros. In that country, they call them safety vests. I said, go and put on a safety vest tomorrow. Put on, Come in in jeans and a T-shirt. Put on a safety vest. And at 1230 go and walk down into the warehouse and sit down and say to the staff, I'm coming to have lunch with you because I really would like to know from you if there's a better way we can do things. And they thought I was completely mad and I pushed them and pushed them. And eventually a couple of weeks they did that, later they did that. And their whole attitude changed to the work and the way the staff were doing things. Um, they got a few ideas, nothing significant. But even the staff's attitude to them changed as leaders. And so just that simple act of being human and not being in the ivory tower makes a big difference. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Yeah, I, I think I that's agree. that's amazing that's, advice for nearly any leader listening. it would be something, there'd be a principle there'd in that story that people can that can really unpack. Really uh, tell us about your book in, in 2018 and I guess the key... Uh, takeaway, maybe the key takeaway you got from writing that book, um, but but also the key message in case people are interested, Ralph. So, yeah, it's interesting. I suffered incredibly from imposter syndrome. I mentioned that earlier. But a lot of people, you know, don't really see their leadership because they are suffering from this imposter syndrome. So in 2015, I, I spoke my first ever professional speaking gig, and I had a great crowd, great feedback. I got on the plane flying back to Perth. All I had was an iPad and I started typing my story on the iPad and I wrote 2,000 words between Melbourne and Perth, which is pretty hard on a non-tactile surface, I have to say. Anyway, I then carried on for nine months and every morning I got up at 5.30 and I wrote another few hundred words and I wrote a few blogs in between and incorporated those in. And about nine months later, I thought, I've got a book. And what do I do with it? And I, then I said, oh, my God, no one wants to hear my story. I'm just going to put it away. And that was late 2015, early 16. In 2017, I was in South Africa working with a couple of clients. And I got talking. I had dinner with my cousin whose wife had just left her job as book buyer at a, at a business after 25 years and had started her own small publishing house. And I said, look. You're going to be the first one to read my book. Here it is. I sent her a copy. And she came back about a week later and said, the story is great. Just write another five or 10,000 words and we can publish it. And so, so that's the story behind it. But I suffered incredibly from this imposter syndrome after having written it down. And what is in the book? It's called Dive In, Lessons Learned Since Business School. 
It's about my lessons that I've learned in running, growing, and exiting businesses. And and I was I suddenly said I went. There's stuff in there that doesn't make any sense to anyone except me, and no one wants to know about it. So that was the background to it. Why I called dive in? It's called dive in because on the back of the book it says business does not have to be complicated. Business can be simple. Take a breath, dive in, and adjust your course while you're moving. And the opening story in the book is about my triathlons and how that came to fruition in triathlons, but how it also related to business. And so that's that's the background to the book. It's about doing things just because the hairs on the back of your neck are feeling right. And if mm. they're not feeling right, then don't do it. But sometimes you have to just take a chance and, and dive in. And what's the worst thing that can happen is you'll fail. Yeah, that's it's funny how yeah, often that comes up with leaders comes. about just diving in. What about the excellence framework that you've mentioned around leadership strategy and culture? Can you unpack that model a little bit? Yes, absolutely. So so if we use a sailing analogy, I, I, I enjoy being on the water, you know, Perth. Well, the whole of Australia has great waters for sailing and boating and stuff. So so I, I like to say that if you could imagine, and this is an audio podcast, so we need people to use imagination. If you could imagine three circles joined together, you know, with a common area right in the middle, and those circles are culture, leadership, and strategy. If you have a great culture and a great strategy, but no leadership in your organization. So, you know, you have you have got all the right plans in place. You've done this work um, to create this the, the strategy, but you have no one leading the charge. You are like a, a, a sailing ship without a rudder. You're rudderless. You, you can't, st- there's no one steering the ship. It's moving, but there's no one steering it. If you, are, on the other hand, have a great culture, and fantastic leaders, like people who are admired in the community, but the organization has no strategy. You're a little bit like a, that same sailing ship, but without a compass because you're directionless. There's, you know, you've got, you, you're heading off at a fast rate to nowhere because you don't actually know where you're going. And if you have leadership and strategy, but you have no culture that backs that up, no no backbone of a rich and robust culture, you have a toxic culture, then you become like that same sailing ship sitting out there in the water and there's no wind to drive the sails. So everyone's just sitting out there sort of floating around in circles, not moving in any direction, not being driven in any direction, just because there's nothing driving the organization, which in my mind is culture. And all of those things, if you get them all right, the middle of those three, the intersection of those three is what I call the return on culture. You know, that's the return on investment. That's the excellence. You know, my favorite, uh, you know, description of excellence is that excellence is showing up every day as the best version of yourself. If you can get your team members to show up every day as the best version of themselves, then you're halfway to winning the excellence battle. I like that definition. And um, uh, thank you for unpacking the model. So what do you see as the biggest challenge of the three for leaders at the moment? When you're working with leaders, is it evenly spread? Are you seeing that a lot of people are nailing strategy and leadership but struggling with culture? Or uh, I just, you know, just picked one randomly. But what are you seeing out there in the field, right? Okay, so it's actually different. So some particularly people, and I'm talking in the medium enterprise sector now, you know, 10 to 100 or 200 staff, um, although I think the bigger corporations are even more guilty of it. So strategy is often seen as, as this thick document that's developed once a year by the leadership. It sits on everyone's desk and no one looks at it till next year's strategy conference. That's a little bit facetious, but that's how a lot of people who've come out of the corporate see strategy. One of the things I do a lot of work on is what I call the the plan on a page, strategy on one page. Um, and, And it is about exactly that. It is about 
being able to define everything around the organization on a single page that every team member can buy into. So, so that I think is one of the challenges of strategy. Every organization is different. That's the problem. Um, on the leadership mm. side, you get a lot of managers who've, who've come up through the corporation and are what I call when we managers. Because every time you ask them a question, the answer starts with, when we did this five years ago, it never worked. And so those are the when we managers. So <laughs> I, I, like think, I, th I think leadership is, leadership is part of it and growing leaders. But I think it's about identifying the leadership potential in everyone and empowering them to, to grow. Culture has become the flavor of the last 10 years. You know, you know, culture, eat strategy for breakfast is one of the most common sayings um, attributed to Drucker. Um, in fact, there is no actual proof that it was said by him. But one of the speeches, the keynotes that I give is entitled, if culture really ate strategy for breakfast, what's for dinner? You know, where are we going with this? What is the future <laughs> of culture? Mm -hmm. And part of that is just driving this idea within organizations of, of this flat structure, of, of communication, of getting rid of, of silos where, yes, there's a department for this and a department for that. But if they all buy into a greater overall set of values and, and a set of, 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 I don't like the word vision, but I talk about values and purpose. If people can buy into the great organizational purpose, then we get communication happening. And that creates a rich and robust culture. As soon as people don't buy into a purpose and try and build their own fiefdom, then you get a toxic culture because you get internal organizations competing against each other. Wow, that's a great wow, that's summary. A Thank you for, for unpacking that. Let's... Um, I, I will ask you in a moment how people can find out more about about that. So I'll make sure I do that. But first, let's jump into Leadership Express. Uh, so I have a bunch of questions. Are you ready? Shoot. Okay. Firstly, what's a book that you've gifted a lot to other people? Um, the book's called Radical Candor. Um, and Radical Candor is it's a hard book to read because it's 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 written I think as a PhD actually, and so. But the idea behind radical candor is all about leadership. It is about, there, there are four quadrants, as every good academic has four quadrants in their <laughs> model. Um, but the quadrant where leaders care about their team, but also challenge them directly, are prepared to actually stand up and challenge team members, that's called radical candor. And so... The, mm. the whole book is about these four different quadrants that you get, okay? Um, uh, you know, for instance, if somebody really cares about the team but doesn't actually challenge staff members to do anything or challenge team members, that's called ruinous empathy and, and, and without going through the whole model. But, but those are the, you know, or, or, or you know, when, when they don't care and don't do anything, you know, um, you know, that's defined as obnoxiousness, you know. And so so each one of those quadrants to me, and, and it's a great book on leadership because if you can truly get to a point of radical candor where you can call a spade a spade and call staff out, but they know you love them anyway, that's the true leader. I agree. Great recommendation, agree. great, great book, and wonderful wonderful terminology and i do i do love a good quadrant and it's really helpful isn't it thinking where am i in that square and uh hmm am i really i think i'm a great leader because i care a lot but am i challenging my people uh which is where a lot of leaders might might be might find themselves oh i guess having to potentially step up and and go okay what does it look like to shift into that quadrant thank you great recommendation any great podcasts that you're listening to at the moment or other sources that you're reading watching listening to right now well i could advertise my own podcast called the business excellence podcast you may uh, it has 140 episodes live and we've really focused on excellence you know we've had a amazing guests from all around the world focused on on, on specifically on excellence um, and and how to make things better and more excellent. 
wonderful recommendation. Make sure you everyone uh, checks that out. What's the name of it again? Just for those who are the driving business or excellence podcast. Business excellence it's called podcast. the business excellence podcast. Available on all sources or excellencepodcast.com. And um, there is a new series launching this week, uh, this year, called the Top Five. And it's it's a lot of my previous guests coming back to talk about their top five tips for excellence and in a variety of different settings. Oh, I love that. Uh, make sure everyone make sure you go and check it out. What is a time management or productivity tip you'd give or a tool or resource you use? Um, I, I know this sounds really weird, but I'll, it, it's one of the chapters in the book, but I'll talk about the Monday to Friday system that I put in for my staff. And that was when they were managing client files that have 40 or 50 files on their desk and it would be psychologically problematic because they would see this big pile, choose the easy ones and push the hard ones to the bottom of the pile. What I did is I put a whiteboard and I have a whiteboard in my own office to do exactly the same planning. A whiteboard next to everyone's desk with five columns called Monday to Friday. And as my staff would pick up a file and they'd say, well, Jono, we'll use you as the example. Jono, um, they'll send you an email on Monday saying, Jono, I spoke to the bank. We expect an answer on Thursday. They would take a physical file and put it on the Thursday column and write Jono under, under Thursday. That way it's off their desk. It's out of their vision. And if they've got 40 files, that suddenly comes down to eight per day. So they're not feeling incredibly overwhelmed. They can manage their time efficiently on a day because they now have a specific task of eight to 10 files a day, which is easily manageable. Yeah, that's great. That reminds me of when I uh, was in a sales role and I was doing using a paper system and uh, which, and so I was there, this is, this is a, a while back and we were trying to transition online, which, which is its own story. <laughs> but I remember having a filing cabinet with the days of the month. So one to one to 31, and it was a bit similar where once I would just sort of put that, I need to talk to that person or the next step is on that date. And it's so, it sounds so simple, but it, you're exactly right. And you just reminded me of it by telling that story. There was something about hitting, even though there might have been, you know, for me, a hundred different people that I was that I was connecting with, just being able to pull out that next day and there were just those eight people that I'd said I was going to get back to on that day was a big psychological relief. So that's that's interesting. Yeah, so yeah, what, that's we've done, what, what we've done there, Jonah, is we've actually because of the potential or the last two years of the pandemic and lockdowns and things, we've moved those whiteboards onto Trello. Yes. And everybody in the office, including myself, can see everyone else's Trello board. So we're using, and the reason behind that is, if we suddenly go into a snap lockdown, as West Australia has done a number of times, well, my staff are all set up to work from home and literally they can log in. They don't need their whiteboard in front of them because it's on the Trello board. And so we did that transition a while back just to to cope with the pandemic. Otherwise, we'd probably have never done it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Trello, uh, I can see Trello working really well for that. That's brilliant. Love it. Okay, a great piece of advice that you've received at some point in your life. Um, I guess the greatest piece actually comes um, it, it is sort of religious based or, or biblical, but, you know, modified for the modern leadership world, which is treat people as you would like to be treated yourself. Um, That's good. You know, show people the respect. I, I had a, a business partner years ago who would call his staff when him and I had meetings, he'd call his team Muppets. Mm. And that to me showed a lack of respect for his team. Whereas, you know, my team, like a well, classic example, the night before we recorded this last night, I I'd sent an email to one of my team members about 630 because a client, an old client had queried something. And I got a response back at 930. This morning when she walked into the office, I called her over into my office. I didn't embarrass her. And I said, why were you sending me emails at 9.30 last night? And she said, okay, we're not going to have this conversation. I said, yes, we are. Because, and I spoke about her mental health and not breaking down and, and, and that sort of stuff. So, so it was an interesting conversation around that, but it was about treating people 
you know, like you want them to be treated. I, my, I have one new staff member, and that's because my PA had a baby and resigned. Mm. But every other staff member has been here eight years or more. Wow, it's amazing. Uh, that's, I, 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 it is, um, it is an obvious one, but it's so, it's so good, isn't it? I heard, I think from the top of my uh, mind, it was Dr. Philip Moulds, who's the headmaster at a school here in Queensland, Rockhampton Grammar School, who came on uh, the podcast a little while back. And he talked about, I don't remember the name of his kids off the top of my head, but he talked about having a rule where he would use his kids' names. And his question would be, what would I want a leader to do if this person that I'm leading was one of my kids? And it's like a, yeah. a, a version of the same question. And when you really wrestle with that, it really changes um, how you do it. And I like how you, it comes back to radical candor. It connects, you know, radical candor, that idea of, well, if I really care about this person, if that was me in their shoes, then I would want, even though I might not like it at the time, I would want them to actually bring it up with me for for my best interest and actually go there because they really care about me. Absolutely. And so that's the relationship I have built with the staff, you know, in, the first lockdown in, 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 I was actually in isolation because I'd been at a wedding in Bali. The very first lockdowns in March 2020. The first thing I did was I made a nine o'clock meeting every day for everybody on Zoom. And I said, I don't want to talk about business. Call me later about business. This is a are you okay meeting. I just want to see everyone's face. Everyone had to have their cameras on. I wanted you to banter as if you were sitting around the coffee machine having coffee in the morning. And for me as the <laughs> leader, it was just about seeing the eyes, seeing what they looked like. Yeah. And just making sure they were okay. I just, in the most, in the a podcast I just recorded before this one, Rail, we talked about um, this idea of the water cooler meeting where you actually replace the water cooler in the office or the coffee machine which is in some ways the new water cooler uh, <laughs> you know where people go and make themselves yeah. a, a nice coffee you know in a lot of offices I, I, I and it's so funny you brought that up again because i 100 percent think every leader needs to consider doing that particularly if you have remote teams uh which we all have had to have in some sort of version through the pandemic and moving forward it's only going to get more like that so what can you do to create a meeting where it's a um you know you just and i i think what you said is a brilliant starting point have everyone put their video on and make it a no work and just just banter and check in an are you okay meeting that's just i love it well so on the 30th of june uh 2021 um, we were in lockdown in Perth and 30th of June being the end of the financial year. And traditionally in financial services, everyone has a drink on, you know, drink together on the 30th of June saying we made it through another financial year, basically. So again, in the morning, I sent a, a message out to the team said, you know, virtual drinks, bring your own at four o'clock this afternoon. And I sent them a Zoom link. And then about 11 o'clock in the morning, I had this this flash of, I'm not sure where, what, if it was, if I could call it brilliance, but I got a hold of my local um, bottle shop, Dan Murphy's, um, and I called them and I spoke to one of the managers and I said, I've got a list of all my staff's physical addresses so I could log into the office and HR files and get all the addresses. Can I arrange for delivery at 3.30 this afternoon to each one of them of a bottle of gin, four bottles of tonic, and for the people who don't drink in the office, a non-alcoholic bottle of gin and they went sure and they arranged everything for me and suddenly at you know quarter to four I started getting these messages from the staff going okay we've got our gin can we meet now <laughs> um, and so that was a really that was a really fun thing to do and you know it it proved that you can actually do things to build teams for remote teams that's great. And I think That's if great. people That's listening great. should people probably listening. consider just uh, yeah. taking that and, and running Making with it. That's that. just one of the best ideas I've heard recently around remote teams. Um, honestly, because it, it's, I don't think we hit that point enough. We do a lot of other things, but that idea of how do you truly create that camaraderie that you get face to face? And that's, that's genius. Okay. Let's keep going. A movie or TV show that really impacted you? Um, interestingly, billions, uh, and not the latest few series. Um, and and why? Because I used to travel a lot. So 2019, 
I was my biggest year as a professional speaker. I spent five and a half months traveling the world, speaking in really cool, exotic places. And on the planes, I would always have my headphones on, listening to some story in the background whilst on my laptop, doing other work, writing blogs, etc. And for some reason, the, there were a few lines, and probably a dozen, in the early seasons of Billions, where I'd be listening vaguely in the background, and I would suddenly stop, rewind, and listen to it again, and that one sentence would become a whole blog on management. Okay? And, and so... That, that was one of the series that actually had quite an interesting impact because the, the series I thought was a little far-fetched and whatever else, but I think they actually had some nuggets in there that you had to capture the nuggets. I, and I'll give you one quick example was the, the one uh, person turns around to the potential investor in the business and says, don't worry, I'll be down there in the, tr in the trenches fighting with the troops. And the investor said, no, I don't want you to be there. I want you to put your gun down. I want you to go back to the mountain. And I want you to be as the leader to survey the whole surrounding. Just because when you're in the trenches, you're looking through the very narrow sights of a gun. You're only seeing a very narrow picture. As a leader, you need to go to the mountain and survey the whole surrounding. And that was just a bit of advice given in the movie. And I ended up writing two blogs on that. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's I, I agree. It is a really, there are some nuggets in there and that's why I love that question. Billions has come up before. Uh, as someone else has mentioned, Peaky Blinders. <laughs> I love the uh, the different yeah. movies and TV shows that leaders go, you know what? I <laughs> wouldn't necessarily say watch it as a leadership book or you know, a leadership movie, but that show really has some great things in it. Billions, great. And um, just a couple more. If you could only give one piece of leadership advice to a young leader, what would you say? Go go softly with a big stick. And don't slam doors behind you. Don't necessarily beat up people. But be softly spoken but assertive. Softly spoken but assertive. Gee, I really like that. And the last question, uh, if... I guess for you with what you're doing in your speaking, but also in your business, what's the best thing that you're doing at the moment that other leaders should know about? Um, I mean, one of the things I'm doing is I'm really pushing hard um, to, you know, two days time, I'm running a one day uh, workshop for an accounting business on a plan on a page where we'll go through a full day of planning exercise for each department but end up with a total business plan for the entire business on one page. I'm an absolute believer in keeping things simple. And if you can get the whole team to agree on a strategy on one page, then everyone is crystal clear on the direction that they're going for the next year. I, I was listening to a, a religious talk on faith, and, and, and this is mm. not a religious comment, but there was an analogy used in that talk. And, and, and the question was, is what is faith? And, and the answer was, when you are, if you could imagine yourself in a rowing boat going down a river at night in the middle of a thunderstorm, right? So everyone can kind of get the picture. And suddenly there's a flash of lightning. At the moment of the flash of lightning, you can absolutely see with crystal clarity exactly where you're going. And a moment later, you're back in the darkness and the description was, well, that was faith. The faith was to, based on that vision of where you were going, keep navigating the course. But I really like the idea of that a, a one-day strategic planning where we end up with a plan on a page is like that flash of lightning. Because at the end of the day, everyone on the team should go, wow, we see the direction. The key to leadership is the next day, is motivating the staff the next day to keep on with that vision. That's really profound. That's really uh, I, and I think I think a lot of leaders I think a lot of from my experience, a lot of leaders out there will be going, plan. Yeah, our strategic plan is a document we make once a year that then gets that doesn't get looked at. And I think a plan on a page from the view of that 
that um, that lightning bolt that you know you you know it's not going to light everything up for the next three months, six months, year. But what you it may not do that, but what it will do is give you clarity in that moment that you then walk out of and keep everyone aligned to that until you meet again. And putting it on one page, I think, is is a really good idea. So wonderful place to to finish up. Well, we've mentioned a couple of places. Uh, that people can find you, but uh, particularly with the new tool that's that's coming out, uh, Rail. What, where can people find you online? Just to reiterate, and and where can they find that new tool when that's uh, when that gets released? So it'll all be on on railbricker.com. I'm very accessible at rail r a e l at railbricker.com. I'm very active on LinkedIn. Uh, I don't know thirteen, fourteen thousand followers and 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 connections. So I, you know. Connect with me. Don't try and sell me anything, but connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm always happy with that. And um, those are probably the two best places, but I am on all the socials except for Twitter. I just don't get Twitter. Maybe I'm too verbose to speak in 140 characters. Um, but, yeah, so, you know, either email me, reach out to me, and and as a special for your listeners, if anyone wants to go to railbricker.com slash free book, they can actually download a PDF version of Dive In Lessons Learned Since Business School. Wonderful. Railbricker.com forward slash free book. Yep. Perfect. Well, uh, thank you to our listeners for for joining. I know a lot of you will have gotten a lot out of today and there'll be a few of you jumping into that URL while I'm still talking, which is great. And make sure you also jump over to look up the Business Excellence uh, podcast with Rail. And um, I think you can just see from today's conversation, the really interesting perspective and and I've loved it. Um, Don't forget, we also have the Leadership uh, Question of the Day podcast where I put a, a different question out there every day to challenge you as a leader and put a stone in your shoe. And the second thing is the John O. White Leadership Podcast, which is more just just me talking about tips for well-being or leadership or how to run an off-site and all sorts of things like that. Uh, but the main thing I want to land on is a massive thank you uh, to Rail for being so generous with your time and for giving all of us, I know based on my experience right now, the wheels are really turning. I know I, I do say that a lot at the end of the podcast, but I think it's because I, I, I tend to have people on who really think think uh, really deeply about things but honestly rail some of the some of the things you've shared and the story and um what your you know that that quote from the start around what your dad said around 40 years and th- there's been a lot in this episode that's that's really been a great encouragement and uh to me and and I'm really going to take away a lot from it so thank you so much for coming on thank you it's been a pleasure and I love you know I love the idea of leadership conversations because I think as leaders, we need to have more conversations to encourage more leaders. Um, it's not an exclusive space. You know, everyone can lead in their particular way. And I think that's what we have to encourage people to do. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership, and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage, consultclarity.org, right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. 
And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited, early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders. And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I, I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this. I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and, and please do that. And look for me, John O'White, or clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. Uh, 95% of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.